Jesus and rightly represent him before a dying world. Father God, we pray that we would think of you, to think of our Lord and Savior Jesus, abide in him, rejoice in him, and share him with one another. So Father, we pray that you would be with uh, Pastor Llewellyn as he breaks the bread of life and may find lodgment in our hearts and change us for the better, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I don't know if it's the dust or anything, but uh, I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It is great to be back after a hiatus of a few years. I just aimed the fan at me. Um, I was at the Mansas camp, me uh, camp meeting to open up their, their camp meeting weekend, and uh, their uh, attendance was good. But then I went to Alberta last weekend, and uh, they said it was light, but it was a packed house out there in Alberta. So now we're here in the uh, in Pugwash, off to Newfoundland on Monday. Anyways, it's great to be here, great to be back, and to see everybody here. Uh, one person asked me yesterday, said, Paul, what in the world do you do as the secretary, especially since translated into French uh, in Le Messenger, it doesn't come across that. And I was explaining what, what we do, said I work with the the executive secretaries of all the conferences or the vice presidents across Canada. And uh, one of the works that we do at the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, is to support the most important ministry within the church in Canada. And, and, and what is the most important ministry? Yes, it is. It's the local church and the local school. That is the most important work that goes in, on in all of Canada. And sometimes we look at the GC as being the most important, or the North American Division, or the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada. But the most important is that we support our conferences and make our conferences strong. Because when we have strong conferences, they can best support and make strong churches and strong schools. And that's where the work of God goes on, at the front line, not at the back lines. The most important work is the front line work. And so we want to make sure we're here to, to, to serve. And so my position is to serve the executive secretaries across Canada in their work and support the presidents and also the treasurers across that so that we have strong churches and strong schools across. Anyways, I just wanted to explain that, bring you greetings from Mark Johnson, from Paul Musafili, from Rose Jacinto. Um, Mark Johnson is over in Newfoundland this weekend. I'll be going over there and he'll be, we'll be trading places. I think he'll be just driving by. He might stop in for camp meeting, uh, but we'll see. And um, our, uh, uh, for Mark Johnson, Paul Musfili is the treasurer. Rose Jacinto is the under treasurer. And we oversee all the work in Canada. Uh, we are a unique union compared to other unions in uh, the North American division. We are the smallest, even though we govern eight time zones across Canada, Canada from St. Pierre, Miquelon, all the way to British Columbia. Uh, we are the largest. The largest conference in the world is here in Canada, and that's the Mansas Conference. And so we have a lot of territory to cover, but we are the smallest union in size of workers. Most unions will have a lot of departments and a lot of staff. We don't, we have a lot of volunteers. We do have an education department, indigenous ministries, and communications. But outside of that, our ministerial department are all part of volunteers. Pastor Matar Solomon serves on that committee. Um, and our, your youth director, uh, Ricky Schwartz, serves on the youth advisory across Canada. So most of our departments are all volunteer run and all that stuff. But what we do is we're here to serve. And the reason why we have volunteers is instead of paying somebody to be in that position, we would rather have that money go into ministry at the ground level. So that's just some of the things there. Anyways, let's bow our heads for prayer and then let's get started for our study today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us. Watch over us today. Let the words that I speak represent you and that, Lord, you will be glorified in all ways. In your name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles or your electronic device, open up with, uh, to me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, um, 
I like reading through each year uh, the different Gospels, just because each one Gospel writer has a different interpretation, a different viewpoint, a different way of looking at the Gospel message. Anyways, Luke chapter 6 opens up with two stories. I have this beautiful fly just flying around my head, so if you see me swatting and not hallucinating, it's a fly. Anyways, the first, the first story that takes place in Luke chapter 6 is a, a discussion about the Sabbath. It says, one, one Sabbath day, Jesus was walking through some grain fields with his disciples, and they broke off the heads of grain, rubbed it in their hands and their husk, and ate the grains. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? So there must have been that there were Pharisees along with them in the group. And the uh, disciples were hungry, and they started to do this, and they started to get some of the grains and pop it in their mouth, like we might go and pick a fruit off a tree, or a nut off a tree, or something like that. The disciples were hungry. It was a Sabbath. Instead of the Pharisees feeding the disciples, they decided to say, hey, listen, guys, you're not doing what, was, what is right. They started nitpicking. They were just looking for things to agitate on. And Jesus replied, haven't you read in the scripture where David, and it goes on there. And he says, and he added, the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees were thinking, they said, something's wrong here. And then the very next story that we see here is Jesus heals on the Sabbath. And he goes through the whole thing. But the end of it, in Luke chapter 10, right at the very end, and he said, so the man held out his hand and it was restored. And this, the enemies of Jesus, these are the Pharisees, they were the enemies of Jesus, were wild with rage and began to discuss what to do with him. So here's these Pharisees looking at Jesus, just doing everything they could do. <coughs> Sorry. Um, uh, looking at everything that they could do to find out what was wrong with him. And they said, hey, Jesus, you shouldn't be doing this. Oh, Jesus, you shouldn't be doing that. Or look at your disciples. You're doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. They were rising themselves up to a high level and trying to put the disciples down or Jesus down. Guys, legalism always does that. One of the ways that legalism is acted out is you have to rise yourself up to a higher level and you have to put other people down. And so that what was happening back there. And that what was coming out from the Pharisees. Their legalistic instinct was, look at us and look how bad you're doing. And so guys, whenever we're, um, whenever we're engaged in spiritual life, be very careful when you start to put another person down. Because that means you're trying to raise yourself up. Look at me. Look what I do. I do the right things. That person does the wrong things. And that's true with any ministry that we watch on the internet, we watch on our DVDs or CDs. If there is a ministry that is always putting something down about maybe the work of God in the church or this end or that end, be very careful what you let in. Because the Pharisees did the same thing. They were always putting something down, always finding something wrong. And when we do that, it changes our thinking the way we think and perceive, and we become very negative. In fact, we start to sometimes get crazy talk, and the Pharisees showed that. They were wild with rage. Here Jesus was in their presence. The, the very Son of God was with them, and all that they could do was react with rage. People, when we are always looking at the negative, of our brothers and sisters, maybe the church work, or maybe so-and-so, or maybe so-and-so here. When we start to look at the bad, it starts to change our thinking. The gospel message says, look and bring up the church. Lift up the church. Edify each other. And what the Pharisees were doing, they weren't edifying, they were putting people down. And, and see, the work of God means to edify and to lift people up. I love what Pastor Mike presented last night because that is the gospel message. How do we share this good news to the world that Jesus gives us so much? So here we're going to start to investigate it this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is Jesus probably his longest explanation or, or sermon. If you notice that Jesus didn't have long sermons, but... Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is his longest explanation of, uh, of a sermon title. 
And his disciples asked him and said, what, what will it be like in the last days? And so Jesus went into details of some of the last day things. One, what will happen when Jerusalem falls? And number two, what will happen when Jesus comes back? And as he is going through this, he tells four important stories that help us understand the last day events. And they come across in a very different way. You see, guys, remember I said the Pharisees were always sharing bad news. They were always looking to put somebody down, always looking to raise themselves up. You, you, you see, people, and I told you, be careful of what you let into your minds because it has, a, it has a huge impact on how we relate the gospel message to other people. And uh, a few years ago, we used to have these things called libraries. You remember them? You, you, you walk into a library, and they usually had different sections in the library. One side, it would be the fiction, and the other side would be the non-fiction. And we knew that when we went into the fiction section, this stuff is not real, it's made up, it's story time. But when we would go to the non-fiction section, this stuff is more scientific, it's, it's something that we can base truth onto. But nowadays, truth is, well, there's truth there, there's truth there, or it's my version of truth or your version of truth. We go on the internet and there's no fiction section and non-fiction section. Everything's amassed into one, and so we get lost on there and, and psychologists are actually doing studies on this and finding out that the internet is erasing truth. We don't know where to stand on anything. We, there, there's, there, there's, this is truth for you, that's truth for you. You believe this, you believe that. And that the internet is really taking away people's understanding of truth. Well, you and I know that there's one standard of truth that cannot go wrong. Even if people want to try to disprove it or say this or that about it, there's one standard of truth that cannot be argued about, and that's the Word of God. But I'm going to say, people, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Jesus, as he's telling the stories, starts dividing people into two groups. There's a group here and a group here. I want to look at relationships. I want to look at the people's relationships in these stories with the Master or with Jesus, or with God, and see how our relationships play out in how we treat other people. The first one, if you look in Matthew chapter 24, is found in verse 45. It says, a faithful, sensible servant is one whom the master can give the responsibility of managing the other household servants and feeding them. So the job of this servant in the household is managing the other household servants and feeding them. Is that a good thing? It is a very good thing because people want food. And so this, this, this household manager is put in charge of managing and feeding. If the master returns and find that servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. Can you imagine that? He puts this faithful servant who does his work of feeding and managing, puts him in charge of all he owns. Jesus says, this is yours now. But then the story goes on. Now, but before the story goes on, this person must have a very good relationship with the master. There must be a respect, there must be a love there. This person goes, listen, I love working for my boss, and because I love working for my boss, and my boss is so caring and kind, I want to be the same type of manager that he is with me. I'm going to do the same thing with my household servants that he puts me in charge of. I'm going to be kind, and most of all, I'm going to feed them. But what if the servant is evil and thinks, my master won't be back for a while, and he begins beating the other servants. Partying and getting drunk, but I'm not going to focus on that. He starts beating the other servants. Now, we always think in our heads, oh, he's beating the other servants. It must be physical. Well, what happens if it's not physical? What happens if it's emotional or, or uh, psychological abuse? 
So this other servant starts going around, and because of his relationship is not good with the master, and he starts to take his duties lightly, he naturally starts beating the people that he is in charge of. The Pharisees did the exactly the same things. Jesus says in, in uh, oh, I think Matthew 23. Matthew 23, Jesus says what the, the Pharisees were known for doing. They were known for being very hard on other people. They were known for being the rigid ones that they weren't there to share good news. They were shared to ba share bad news of how good they were and how bad you were. Read Matthew chapter 23. It describes it. And so right here, we see exactly the same thing happening. Two groups of people. One does a good job of feeding. The other one does a good job of beating. And then it says parting and getting drunk. In other words, this person is so self-focused. So we have one of the first parables talking about how people in the last days will be. Not outside the church, but inside God's house. Two groups, one feeding, one beating. So people, how we view Jesus, how we view the Father, how our relationship is with our, whether you want to call master, savior, brother, friend, how our relationship is with our Father dictates or how we view that relationship in how we treat other people. If our relationship is strong and, and, and based on the gospel message, our natural result will we will be feeding other people. Mike told a story about Betty last night. Betty that uh, was in the psych ward that you had given Bible studies to, and then in the third or fourth night she was giving Bible studies to other people. She started feeding other people. That's what happens when you take hold of the gospel message. You want to feed other people. But see, guys, the Pharisees were not doing what God wanted them to do. They were not feeding other people. So when we're not feeding other people, we have to come up with something else that will occupy our time and make it look like we're doing something. And so what they sort of focus on, thing on is, how can we put other people down? And how can we raise ourselves up in their legalistic understanding? And so people, when we are not engaged in God's work, we will naturally um, revert to a mind understanding or a behavior pattern in which we start being mean to other people. We start putting them down. We start beating them. We start uh, reducing them to nothing as we were we elevate ourselves to everything. So we have to be very careful about how we see Jesus when we see him in the proper light that he gives himself here in the Bible. And that's the entire Bible, from Genesis to, to Revelation. When we see the gospel message and it has an impact on our lives, we will naturally feed other people. So let's go on. Then Jesus goes on in Matthew chapter 25 about the parables of the ten bridesmaids. This is a good one. We've studied it to death. But you know there's, there's five foolish and five wise. The five wise ones prepare to meet the bridegroom. I had a friend once who had not seen his fiancée for six to eight months. And she was flying in to see him where he lived. They had not seen each other. This was during COVID. And as they are flying in, as she is flying in to see him, he drives up to the airport. Now, you weren't allowed out into the airports at this time because, you know, it was a lot of restrictions. And so he didn't want to pay for parking, so he just, you know, did the circle around there because, you know, airports, even the Moncton Airport is really strict. You can't just stand there and wait. You have to go to the cell phone lot and wait. And so he just kept circling around. When he saw her, uh, she came to the car, she got in. Remember, they had not seen each other for six to eight months. Fiance. And... Um, she, she didn't appreciate the greeting that she got. You see, most people would have parked the car and waited outside where she was going to come out. And when she came out, he, he was supposed to probably greet her with a big hug. And, and maybe he should have had something else like what? Flower, everybody said flowers, fantastic. He didn't. And it didn't go well for him. In fact, he called me up and said, Paul, what should I do? I said, you go down to the flower shop right now, buy not a dozen, but two dozen roses, and go down there and give it to her. <laughs> not, not relive the airport experience. He said, I will. So he did that. That was a lot better. 
But when we're looking forward to meeting a special person, we prepare the house, we prepare maybe the refrigerator, making sure it is well stocked and stuff like that, because we're happy that this person is coming. And the five wise ones were looking forward for the bridegroom to come, and they prepared. We know that the oil symbolizes the Holy Spirit, so we, we know that these people prepared their daily lives uh, to meet Jesus, to meet, to, to, to meet with Jesus every day. And when they met with Jesus every day, it filled them up with the Holy Spirit. It filled them up with the oil that they needed to get by, because in case they needed extra, they would have it. The other ones, they were kind of indifferent, and they didn't really care. You know, oh, this is just a, a typical wedding we're at. We don't need to prepare. We don't even need to get a gift or anything like that. And, of course, the call went out. The five foolish ones got paranoid and said, hey, where are we going to get some? The other one said, you better go buy your own. We know that the story that they couldn't get in, and they were left out where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here we have a good servant that feeds, a good servant that manages, and a good servant that prepares to meet an important visitor or friend. And then we have one that beats, the one that's self-focused and parting, and the one that's indifferent says, I don't need to prepare, I don't need to get ready for this, I'm okay. We then go on to the next story. And remember, Jesus is starting to separate the two there. There's two men in the first story. One is given five, let's say five million dollars. He goes out and invests it and, when, uh, and over the period of time increases it by five more. The other one is given two million. He does the same thing, goes out there, invests, and he gets two more. And then the last one, where we spend the most time on, is given one and he goes out and sits on it doesn't even invest it in a savings account and here in Canada what would we get 0.75 percent um, all that stuff doesn't even do that just sits on it the master comes back and he goes to the um, uh, the other servants and he says hey listen uh, I, I gave you five what happened and the first one goes well 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 master Jesus I gained five more. And he says, well done. What, you, what has been entrusted to you in little, I'll, 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 I'll make it up to you in a lot. I knew. So in other words, he's saying, I have a relationship with you and I know you were a harsh man. The other two doesn't say about their relationship, but it seems like they have a good relationship with the master because they were happy to do the work that the master gave them to do. This third person says, I knew you were a harsh man. So was his relationship good with the master? No. He understood the master to be harsh. He did not have a good picture of him. And people, there are people in this world that do not understand the gospel message. Do not understand the great gift of Calvary. Do not understand that Jesus, you know, I, I know Mike's going to be sharing this all week long, but the gift that Jesus gives us free of charge. It's here. It's yours. I give it to you. What are you going to do with it now? Our duty is to hold on to it for dear life. But see, this, 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 one, this person here does not have that relationship with the master. And he says, I knew you were a harsh man. Harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid. How many of us people are afraid of our Heavenly Father? How many of us are afraid of God? I'm going to be honest with you, and I've said this up here before. I grew up that way. I wanted heaven and eternal life, but I didn't want to be anywhere near to God, to be near to Jesus, or have the Holy Spirit to have anywhere near me. But I wanted there. I didn't want the alternative. I wanted heaven, but I was so scared of God. Remember the first servant feeds. When that first servant feeds, you don't come up with a, 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 a pail of gravel and say, here's your food. You come out with a meal that you can eat that will satisfy. And the first servant was good at feeding the other servants and managing them well. The other one beat them. You see, people, the relationship we have with Jesus is so important because if our relationship is good, we understand the gospel message. 
we will naturally feed, we will naturally prepare, we will naturally take the things that God gives us and use them for his glory and multiply them. It happens naturally. But see, people, when we don't have that good relationship, but we have a relationship like the Pharisees that, that are not doing the work of God but are so focused on self, raising themselves up and putting some other people down, beating other people and all that stuff, their relationship with Jesus becomes harsh. I knew you were a harsh man, and I was afraid. What's your relationship like with Jesus today, people? Is your relationship strong where you want to go out and feed other people? Where you want that preparation of the Holy Spirit to fill your life? Where, where you want to use the talents that God has given you for his glory? What's your relationship like with Jesus? Are you viewing him as a harsh man? Are you afraid of Jesus? And if you are, people, that doesn't mean like, oh, oh, you're wrong, you're lost, you're gone. No, use that opportunity to say, Jesus, my thinking is wrong. If I think you're harsh, if I'm afraid of you, my thinking is wrong. And I'm afraid today, people, that a lot of Christendom, our thinking is wrong. Instead of being the people that go there to help feed this world, that go to show Jesus what Jesus was really like, remember, we are his hands and feet in the world today. And if we are his hands and feet, then we need to do the work that Jesus has called us to do. We need to be the people that God has called us to be and to share that good news of the gospel. And, and like I said, people, if, if you're not there, don't worry. Jesus provides everything. And one of the things he provides is a new heart. And when we have a new heart and a new mind, we're not scared. We don't view him as harsh. We view him as loving. And we start to behave differently. Now, I know I'm talking about works and all that stuff, but I'm saying that our relationship has a lot to do with how we interact with other people. The last, the last parable that, that Jesus shares here in Matthew 25 is probably one of the most important because it's titled here, The Final Judgment. But the Son of Man, when he comes in his glory and all of his angels with him, and he will sit upon his glorious throne, all the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will place the sheep in his right hand and the goats in his left. Then the king will say those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of this world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I kept the Sabbath. No, does it say that there? I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Notice that none of the actions here that the sheep have are focusing on a doctrine. They're focusing on how we treat other people. And so it goes on. When these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick and or in prison and visit you? And Jesus says, the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And so here Jesus starts to focus on, he says, people, how do we interact with other people that God places around us? How do we interact with people? And, and I have such a hard time with this because every time you come to a stop sign or a street light, who's there at the corner? Yeah, there's somebody asking for money. And I've I, I got to be honest with you. I have trouble with that. In fact, if you go to British Columbia, you're not allowed to do that. It, it's against the law. And they will have signs at this corner. They said, people, inst uh, instead of giving to, to people that are begging, it's against the law to beg. Give to an organization that helps get people off the streets, that helps get people off uh, from homelessness. Give to one of those organizations and do that. So people, what are we doing as a church? And, and, and by the way, we do quite a bit. 
Our church is very active, but we want our churches to be more active in the communities. One of the things that we're doing in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in, in Canada and with ADRA Canada is, is working on getting our churches active in the communities, making sure our churches are getting integrated in our communities so that our communities start to know who we are. But more importantly, we start to know who they are. Um, one of the things that we really have uh, put a lot of effort in is a very simple thing called community gardens. Uh, churches usually sit on properties that have land, hopefully, and that land sometimes just sits there. Uh, the Kingston Church in Ontario, we, through ADRA, sponsored a community garden. And so they made, they had a lot of land that they, they could use, so they made gardens. And they opened it up to the community to come in and farm little tiny sections. They provided water. They even provided some people that, that were there that would had know-how how to plant things. I'm, I'm not a good gardener, uh, so I would need help. You know, oh, this goes in the ground. You just don't sprinkle it on the ground. It goes in. Gotcha. And so that's what they did. And when, when the Kingston Church did that, they started to form a relationship with the community. In fact, even with the extra food that they had, they wanted to make sure it would go to the proper places so that people that did not have enough food would have food. They did this as a community endeavor, not just a seven-day Adventist church, but a community endeavor. And then when the church said, hey, listen, guys, we're, we're, we're growing all this good food, we're going to have a cooking class on how to prepare good food that will nourish our bodies. And so they start to open up their doors to the community. Uh, I remember a few years ago before Pastor Dave came here, I was speaking at his church in Regina. And I was speaking there for the Sabbath for a, a youth uh, weekend. And I came there and I said, Dave, I, I noticed that when I walked into your church, you have an ashtray outside of your church. Why is that? And he said, because Paul, free of charge, Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous use our church for their weekly meetings. We don't charge them. They're, they're open here. We do have our literature out so that they're exposed to that. But we want to make sure our church is a place that they can... Oh, Dave, you're here. <laughs> but he said, we want to make sure our church is open to that. I, the New Minus Church, same thing. Open up your church doors, free of charge, to places that give aid to the communities, like Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know some people say, well, I don't know if I want people like that on there. I don't know if I want cigarette butts. People, don't worry about the cigarette butts. Worry that they're coming there. Making, make, make our churches a place where the community wants to be part of it. Insert ourselves in the community so that the communities know our names, but more importantly, we know the people in the community by name. We know if there are any needs in the community. We know if people are hungry, if people just lost a loved one. One of the greatest things that we can do is when there's a loss in the community, is be there for the funeral. Even in our First Nations communities, honor the people that have gone, that have passed away, People notice that. And one of the things that we're doing here in Canada, people, is we're making good relationships with our First Nations brothers and sisters. And it is going on strong. I, Cam hopefully will be here later on this week. Uh, Dave, did he say he's coming? Yeah, hopefully he's coming. Um, because the work that Indigenous Ministries is going across Canada is so important. So incredibly important. Last week, uh, during Sabbath school time in Alberta, uh, Chief, Randy Herman, uh, Chief Randy Ermanskin was speaking. He is the chief for the Mamawea Tasquatin area. We have a school there. Um, if you ever visit the Mamawea Tasquatin Native School, your mouth will drop open at the work that they are doing in the community there. To give not just a excellent education, but an outstanding. My mouth dropped open. I, I'm a shop fan. I used to teach shop when I was a teacher. Um, not a very good shop teacher. We made uh, birdhouses, and the birdhouses didn't 
they were not nice looking. I was not a good shop teacher, but I taught it because nobody else would teach it. But I'm still thrilled to death about shop class. So I asked them when I went to go visit the school with Daniel Saw last year, I said, can you show us your shop? And the principal that is now there that was the shop teacher, he said, I'll, I'll, definitely I'll show you. We walked in and they had about five bays of welding supplies. We're not talking about just leftover welding supplies. The Welders Union of Alberta outfitted their school with top of the line equipment to welding. So when the students are graduating there, they're expert welders. Their shop, the wood supply that they had was just mind blowing of what they can make there in, in the shop. And, and it was just incredible there. So people were, were making uh, partnerships with our First Nations ships, with our First Nation uh, communities to say, hey, listen, we're here to walk together. We're here to learn from each other. We're here to support each other in needs. ADRA Canada is working on the water supply issue in our First Nations communities. We want to supply clean drinking water to at least one community. We're small, so that's what we'll aim at. It's, it's probably a million, two million dollar project, but that's what we want to do. We want to do that. In, in Alberta right now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada, along with the Alberta Conference, um, they are starting a counseling center uh, right adjacent to the, um, to the band, uh, to the, tri uh, to the re reservation, so that we can work together in helping people that have been harmed by the residential school uh, system. There's a lot of pain out there. There's a lot of uh, painful memories. Uh, Chief Randy was saying, he said, you know, the Pope is coming to apologize. 15,000 survivors are going to be there. And he said, I don't know what the result is going to be. We need many counselors to help our own people uh, process what they have gone through in the residential schools. You see, people, when people are hurting, God's people here, these people that, that Jesus is talking about, the sheep, when, when people are hurting around the world, who goes there? We do. We are going to be the people that are going to be there for the rest of the world. And, and I'm, I'm telling you people, our small little church on this world, we're a small little tiny micro dot compared to some other churches in this world. But how God, what God does through our meager tithes and offerings is incredible. Our ministries that we have, and, and people, one of the things that I overlook here, supporting ministries. Some of our supporting ministries, and, and in Canada we have about seven or eight supporting ministries that work alongside with the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada and our local conferences to do work in other places. Uh, um, it is written as one of them. Uh, gospel outreach is, is another one. Uh, I was just with uh, Kurt, uh, uh, Zinner, Pastor Zinner, last weekend, and we had a very good time. But gospel outreach goes into areas that we, it's hard to have an Adventist presence. And they go into areas and they send missionaries there that are from there a lot. Because when you're from there, you, you don't have some of the cultural issues to break down. And they do work where maybe government said Christianity can't be in here. Maybe the local religion says we don't want any outsiders here and they start to do work there. You see, you see people, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada and in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the world, we are the ones that want to be there when the world is in crisis. If the world is going through anything, we want to be there for them. That's what the Bible says that the sheep are known for. When I'm thirsty, you're there to provide clean water. When I have no food, we're there to help grow the food, to provide community gardens so that our communities have food and we can do it together and once we show our communities how we can help other people the community wants to do a bigger garden next year and we could do that but what, what if your church is located in a city location and you have no gardenable area to garden you go to Home Depot and you buy these Home Depot buckets and you fill them with dirt and you take a little tiny tomato plant and you put a, a bamboo stick in there and that little tiny tomato plant, you, you start it to grow. And then you go around to your apartments and to your other houses where they might not have a backyard to grow anything and you drop off a tomato plant that they can grow for the next few months. And as that tomato plant starts to blossom and it starts to produce these little beautiful cherry tomatoes, they start eating and said, wow, 
and you just put on the bucket your friends, the Seven Day Adventists. So you see, people, we don't have to have an arable garden. We can go around with buckets full of dirt, with plants in them, and help feed our communities. You see, people, food scarcity is becoming, and I don't know how this happens because I, as I travel across Canada, I just see hundreds and thousands of hectares of green produce being produced across Canada. But the world keeps on, you know, that paranoia says, you know, the food scarcity is becoming a real thing in this world. And so people, if we are a church that is taking that seriously and producing green plants that grow green fruits and vegetables, we are going to be the people that are the sheep. We are going to be the people that help feed other people, whether that's spiritual food or whether that's physical food. We are going to be that people. And you see, Jesus also says that there were some goats there. And he says, it's, it says to the goats, um, he says, the king will turn to the one on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. And I, for I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. People during COVID, how many of us visited people in our communities? The shut-ins, the people that couldn't go out their doors, the people that said, where am I going to get my food from? Now, lucky, most grocery stores started to deliver during that time. But how many of us were there to visit people, even if it was going to a nursing home, standing outside of a window and talking through a window at the person on the inside? See, this group here said, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and help you, Jesus? And he will respond, I tell you our truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. So I, I, I'm making a plea to the church today to, in the Maritimes that our churches, wherever we are located, and not just our churches, people, because we, all, we often look to a building as a very special place. Well, I'm going to tell you, your houses where you live is also a very special place. And it's not just the people that live around your church that are important. It's your neighbors who live around your house that is also important. When I lived in Halifax, and I've, I, some of you have heard me say this before, I, I lived in Halifax for six years. Um, I knew the neighbor across the street. He was from Vancouver. He was a doctor that served the military, and he was a doctor. And so uh, I, I knew that sometimes when he was... Um, in surgery or something like that, that he was going to be working for the next 24, 36 hours, 48 hours on the base, you know, serving and all that stuff. And we had a snowstorm. I would go over with my snowblower and I would blow it out. And we became friends. We just talked. And um, when he was coming to the time of his end of his uh, time in the military, uh, we were talking and he said, you know, uh, uh, Paul, we're, we're going to be either going back to Vancouver or I have a job offer in Washington, D.C. with an aid organization, an NGO. And I said, interesting, why, why aren't you going to stay here? He goes, Paul, you and your wife are the only ones we know in the last six years here. None of the neighbors talk to us. Nobody knows us. You're the only one that talks to us. And that was weird. So when we went, moved to New Brunswick, uh, to Moncton, my wife and I wanted to get to know our neighbors. And so we did. And of course, it was a little bit easier in New Brunswick because our, uh, uh, we had a larger, play, uh, larger land area in, in Halifax. Moncton, we were on a postage stamp. Now in Ontario, I'm on a micro postage stamp. Um, but in, in, in Moncton, we wanted to get to know our neighbors. So we got to know our neighbors all around. In fact, we got to know our neighbors down the block. Because it is important as Christians people that we get to know people around us. And, and, and when there is need, when they are in need, we can be there for them to say, hey, listen, I, I don't know what to do, but whatever you need, I'm here. But can I at least pray for you? Prayer has a huge impact. No matter what culture you're from, no matter what religion, when you say, can I pray for you, that means an awful lot. And so when my wife and I moved 
to Bowmanville, Ontario. We know everybody on our street just because we just want to interact with them and also taste some of their food because uh, I, I live on a street full of cultural diversity and it is beautiful to live there. But people, not just where our churches are planted should we be getting to know our community, where our houses are too. I'm going to leave you with, uh, Dave, how much time do I have? Uh, I don't, don't want to overstay my welcome. Okay, one last story. Um, when I was leaving to come out to the Maritimes, um, I had not done a very good job of getting to know my neighbors too much. I, I knew Dave and his wife on one side, and I knew Scott and his wife on the other side, and that's all. And for the five years I had lived uh, north of Bowmanville there before moving out to the Annapolis Valley out here, I said, Lord, I, I, I feel like I, I've let you down. I, I, I never got an opportunity to share you to any of my neighbors. And so I prayed a prayer, and, and we were literally packing up the truck in a week to move out here. And I prayed that prayer, and it was almost instantaneous that there was a knock at my door. And I said, that's weird. Somebody's knocking at our door. So I, I went over to the door, and I opened up the door, and I looked out the door. We had two entrances, a formal entrance and a kitchen entrance. Looking out the door, and there's nobody there. And I'm just like, oh, that's weird. I thought somebody was knocking on the door. And I shut the door. And then all of a sudden, I hear a door at the main entrance, uh, a knock at the door. So I go over there, and I open up the door, and I look out, and I'm going, wow, who's knocking at my door? And I say that out loud, and just as I say that, my neighbor Scott was back at my other door to knock on it. And I, I barely recognized him. See, you know, Scott had a little bit of weight on him, but he was very skinny at this time. I had been away at camp all summer long, so I didn't get to see him, and he had a huge beard on. And I said, Scott, I, 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 did, I didn't, I, I barely recognize you, Scott. You've lost weight. You have a beard. And he says, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I decided to trim up a bit. And he goes to me, Paul, uh, do you have a trailer that I could borrow? And I said, sure, Scott, you know, my, my, me casa, su casa, you know, what's mine is yours, you can do that. So we started uh, walking back into my backyard. And we had a very large backyard. It went back, I had two, two acres of, of land, but it was 100 feet wide by uh, like 800 to 1,000 feet long. And so we started walking back there, and I said, oh, Scott, here's, here's a trailer. I have two trailers you can choose from, a small one and a large one. Which one do you want? And he says, oh, you know, maybe the small one. I can, I can pull it with my car and all that stuff. And I go, Scott, why do you need to, uh, uh, are you moving? And he, he looks at me, and he goes, my wife has been having an affair with my boss um, for the last year. And I just found out at the beginning of the summer and tears start to go down his face. And for the next two hours, I spent time with Scott. I, he talked, I listened. That's a very big trait, people, that we need to do. Let the other person talk, we need to listen. I'm a big talker, but I need to train myself to listen more. And so he talked, I listened, and then we prayed together. He didn't need to use my trailer. He never ended up boring it. He was so lonely, he was so hurting, he just needed somebody to talk to. So for the next week, I made sure I went over to his house every single day before I left. And so people, if we don't know how to reach people, if we don't know how to interact, if we don't know how to feed people, if we haven't been communicating with God on a daily basis and, and, and putting these things before God, said, God, I don't know my neighbors. Provide me an opportunity to, to insert my life into their lives so I can insert you into their lives too. God will open up those doors. And when God gives you talents, people, those are talents to increase your faith and life. Remember that other guy, I knew you were a harsh man and I was afraid of you. People, if our relationship is like that, go to Jesus. Start reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when you're finished reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, read it again about four or five times. Read the book of Romans, the beautiful book of Romans, and end with chapter 14 and soak in chapter 14 because chapter 14 says the, 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 the purpose of Romans. Be gentle with those who are weaker than you. 
and don't argue with them. That's what it says in Romans chapter 14. Open it up and read it. Be gentle with the weaker people in your lives. Because people, when we're strong, we like to make sure our view is stronger than anybody else's. But Paul says, be gentle with those that are weaker with you. Give way to them. And don't argue about stuff. Don't argue about things that don't matter. Be kind and gentle to them. Put their needs above your needs and make sure they are more special to you than anything else and I tell you people when we as a people start to do that not only in our communities around our churches but in the communities where we live watch the power of God start to work through you watch the talents that God has given you start to multiply and people Start to soak in the gospel message every day into your life. Start to look at Jesus, who he is, and how he represents the Father. Start to ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because when that happens, people, you will be amazed at the transformation it will make with you. And when that transformation happens with you, you will be a natural magnet for Jesus. Because wherever Jesus was, there was a crowd of people. And if they couldn't get in through the windows or they couldn't get in through the doors, they cut holes in the ceilings. And you've, uh, most of you have heard me say this before. People, there needs to be more holes in our churches' roofs. There needs to be more holes in the households that we were at because Jesus was in a house not a church, not a synagogue. He was in a house. So people, let's start to make sure we have holes there. That the people that need to be in our houses, that need to be in our churches, that our doors are open. So go out to the highways and byways and reach people for Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for all that you give to our church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, worldwide not just worldwide, to North America. Lord, not just to North America, to Canada. We are such a large, vast country. We're a very secular country. But Lord, it doesn't matter if our neighbors are secular. What matters is if we lift you up in our lives on a daily basis. If we bring you to the communities. If we interact as your hands and feet, Lord. That's what you have called us to do in your church. Lord, sometimes we are so focused on theology that we miss the mercy and justice to give to our neighbors and our friends and even our enemies. So I pray, Lord, we will be a church that will rescue the perishing, that will be there for the dying, that will be the people that will be your hands and feet and your voice. But Lord, we don't necessarily have to use our voices, but we can use our hands and feet to reach this dying world. Lord, light Canada up. Light the Maritimes up. Light each province up with your glory. Work through us, Lord, to, to feed the people, to have that relationship with you, to use the talents that you give us, but most of all, Lord, to reach a dying world. In your name I pray. Amen. And the people of God said, Amen. now let's put it into practice. Amen. At this, um, I think that's a, a little break till, and we meet at, uh, let's say, if we could be present at, 11, at 1045. Uh, yes, 1045. God bless you all.